In this lecture, we will review the structure of a gene. We want to know how to find genes in a newly sequenced phage genome. To find genes, we need to understand what role open reading frames and coding potential play in gene prediction. So the learning goals in this unit are to review the structure of a gene, which you should know fairly well by now, understand the concepts of open reading frame, coding potential, and codon usage. Those are concepts that we'll tackle in this video lecture. In class, we will identify the main features in a DNA genome that indicate the presence of a gene, and we will learn the role of coding potential in gene identification. So what are the components of a gene? A gene, we know, begins oops, with a promoter, a regulation sequence that initiates transcription of the gene, a plus one or transcription start point, a ribosome binding site, an open reading frame, the region that contains the coding for the protein, and finally, something that we didn't talk a lot about last semester is the transcription terminator. So let's review in more detail the components of the promoter. The promoter sequence contains two hexamers, a minus 10 box located approximately 10 nucleotides away from the plus one or transcription start point. And then there are about 16 to 18 bases, spacers between the minus 10 box and the second hexamer, the minus 35 box. Now this is the model of an E. coli promoter. And in another week, we're going to adjust this model a little bit for that of a mycobacterial promoter. So what is the enzyme that binds to the promoter? The RNA polymerase binds the promoter and transcribes or synthesize RNA polymerase beginning at the plus one site and ending at the transcription terminator. Now what is the open reading frame? The open reading frame is a stretch of DNA or of codons that do not contain a stop codon. So it's a long stretch of DNA sandwiched by a start codon and a stop codon. Now last semester we talked about ATG being a start codon, but in fact there are two other types of start codons, although they don't occur as frequently. There is a GTG start and a TTG start, which occurs the least frequent. And of course, every open reading frame needs to have a stop codon, either a TAG, a TGA, or a TAA. After transcription, we have an mRNA transcript with a five prime untranslated region and a three prime untranslated region. This is the part of the DNA, that do, or RNA rather, that doesn't include the start and the open reading frame and the stop. So that doesn't include the coding region. Non-coding regions, coding regions. So the initial, the plus one site is included in the mRNA transcript. And the other thing you need to remember about the five prime untranslated region is it contains the ribosome binding site. Uh, we call this the RBS or the Shine Delgarno sequence. And this is usually located four to nine nucleotides upstream of the start codon. Usually about five nucleotides is optimal. So let's review the process of translation. So here we have our mRNA transcript. And in order to initiate translation, we need to have a start codon. But how does the ribosome know that this AUG is a place where translation should initiate um, and is not just an AUG in a non-translated region or an AUG that's in the middle of a coding region? So that's where the ribosome binding site comes into play. This is the site to which the 30S or small ribosomal subunit binds and the 16S ribosomal RNA in the 30S ribosome 
actually base pairs with the ribosome binding site. And it actually only takes three nucleotides uh, to bind to the ribosomal binding site. So a ribosomal binding site could actually just be made of AGG. With the 30S subunit comes a special initiator tRNA called F-methionine tRNA. And this is the tRNA that binds to the codon. There are some other initiation factors that come into play here, but because it's not super relevant to uh, predicting genes, we'll leave that to learn in BMB 280. So the large subunit of the ribosome also binds, and now we have two sites within the ribosome. In the P site, this is where the start tRNA has bound, and it's also called the P site because this is the site where the peptidyl tRNA remains, and then there's this empty A site. This is the the site where a new amino acyl tRNA will bind to this codon. So in comes the next tRNA, and in this case, it's an arginine. And what will happen now that both of these sites are occupied is this amino acid will be connected to the F-met amino acid in a transpeptidase reaction. And as this occurs, the ribosome shifts forward such that the old tRNA that was connected to F-methionine is booted out, and now the tRNA that holds the arginine is now in the P site. This is the peptidyl tRNA. The arginine is now covalently bound to the methionine, and now we have the A site empty, ready for a new tRNA to bind to the next codon. And so in comes uh, a glycine tRNA. And this process continues until the ribosome comes across a stop codon and the ribosome dissembles and the protein is released. So the other thing I want to remind you for gene structure is that in prokaryotes, at times, only one protein is coded for on an mRNA but more often than not, there are multiple open reading frames on one particular mRNA. And sometimes we see that there's a large gap between the open reading frames on that operon. Um, and so in this case, uh, at, the, at the stop codon of this first purple gene, gene 1, there's a stretch of or non-coding region. And here we have AGG which is enough for a ribosome binding site to initiate translation for the next gene. And in this case, probably the ribosome would dissemble here at the stop codon, and there'd be initiation of a new translation event at this start codon. But the other way it works, particularly in, in phage, what you'll see is a four base pair overlap between one gene and an operon and the downstream gene and an operon. This, as I've mentioned before is the fabulous four base pair overlap. And the reason why this bio biologically makes a lot of sense is if you follow the color coding, here is UGA, the stop codon for the blue gene. Okay, When the ribosome reaches this stop codon, there's no tRNA but rather release factors that come into play at the stop codon. But rather than dissembling, the ribosome backs up one nucleotide, a minus one frame shift. Oopsie, gotta go this way. And what that allows is now a new frame where the first three nucleotides of the red gene are an AUG, a start codon. And so this is a really efficient way for the ribosome to release the protein of the blue gene and immediately begin translation of the next red gene without having to assemble and reassemble the, the ribosome uh, translation complex. So the next concept you guys need to understand is the idea of coding potential. And to understand coding potential, we need to understand what codon bias is. So all organisms or viruses use a certain pattern of codons in a genome or even in a particular gene. And this use or this playing favoritism with codons creates a pattern. 
So let me give you an example. The M tuberculosis genome um, is very rich in GCs. So the majority of the nucleotides in the genome are GCs rather than A's and T's. Well, for we know that there's 20 amino acids. However, there are a choice of 61 codons for those 20 amino acids. 61 because three out of the 64 possibilities for triplets are stop codons. And for most amino acids, there's more than one codon that codes for the amino acid. And a good example is arginine. Arginine has six total codons that code for amino acids. So here's four of them here, and here's two down here. So let's look at the, the four codons, CGU, CGC, CGA, and CGG that code for arginine. M tuberculosis genome is GC rich. So which of the above codons might M tuberculosis prefer if the majority of the nucleotides in M tuberculosis genome are G's and C's? What do you think? Well, let's look at the codon usage table for M tuberculosis. And what I've done here is uh, put a red box around the codon usage for those very same four codons that code for arginine. And what we can see is, is that the codon CGC, all C's and G's, has a very high frequency, 2.64. And the second codon, or most favored codon, is CGG, 1.95. So the codons that are entirely C's and G's are favored over those that have the A's in use. So in an organism, that has a preference for types of uh, codons, this produces a pattern, particularly in those genes that have high expression levels. So what is coding potential? Computer programs can determine the potential for coding in a genome, coding regions of a gene, based on codon usage detected in a genome, or based on known codon usage from an organism like M. smegmatis. So the codon bias produces a pattern in the genome of the frequency of certain codons. And the computer can learn from the codon usage, say, of M. smegmatis, and use those paths, look for those same patterns of codon usage in a phage genome that infects M. smegmatis.